Yeah, g'day. Shane Dowling here from kangarookourtofaustralia.com, and I'm with uh, Turk and Oz Turk from True Crime News Weekly, and we're going to talk about the Bruce Lerman defamation trial and try and uh, have a look at it from a different perspective with the old media reporting, because they're missing it quite a lot, and yeah. some of it's deliberate. Uh, News Corp and ABC got caught out this week trying to suppress certain information at the trial. Uh, they wanted to suppress how much they'd paid Bruce Lerman. <laughs> So and uh, that wasn't well reported. None of the old media seemed to report that at all uh, because they wanted to conceal it. So we'll look at those sort of things at the trial and try and put a uh, a true spin on it, not not the fake spin that we're getting from the old media to a large degree. Well, they might be reporting a lot of the facts. They're still missing a lot. Yeah, one of the key issues that came up during the week is that uh, the court uploaded uh, certain information, which included Bruce Lemon's phones records, uh, phone records. And uh, Yaron Finkelstein was on there um, as potentially someone he spoke to, or was, he was either sending Yaron Finkelstein as a contact to someone else, or receiving as a contact. That's what someone told me, uh, who's better has better knowledge of those sorts of things. But why was Yaron Finkelstein on there? That's the big question. He's uh, Scott Morrison's right hand man, who was prime minister at the time, and the date was uh, the. I think 21st of February 2021, which is six days after Brittany Higgins went public. So it looks like that uh, Bruce Lemon at least would have had some sort of communication, maybe a phone call. And did Yaron Finkelstein say you'd help Bruce Lemon? There's sorts of questions that uh, only Bruce Lemon and Yaron Finkelstein can answer, and maybe others if he did help him. And what, what do you think about that? Uh, what's your take on that, Sirkin? What? Firstly, Shane, thank you for the opportunity once again this week to discuss, you know, the Bruce Lerman defamation trial in a, a bit of greater detail than what we're seeing in the mainstream media. Um, it's probably a lot of people started commenting. This is like a true life miniseries now that a Netflix show might be made about this whole defamation case with all the cast of characters that have been coming into it. Yaron Finkelstein's a very interesting character. Before he was Miss uh, Scott Morrison's Mister Fixer, uh, when Scott Morrison was Prime Minister, he was brought over from Crosby Tech Store, um, where Yaron is quite high up, which is a Liberal Party-aligned PR firm. So one wonders, was Yaron Finkelstein using his PR uh, dark arts, master of the dark arts of PR, was he involved in this Bruce Lerman cover-up as a bit of the brain's trust on how to play this and what kind of um, what kind of angles to take and what to feed the, the old media um, and that hasn't been explained. Uh, no one in the mainstream media has made mention that Yaron Finkelstein, as you said, within a week of Brittany Higgins going public with her claims, her allegations, which seem to be anyone watching the defamation case is, I, I have seen it's coming, um, I guess, much even people who originally supported Bruce Lerman are veering away from that now. Um, but these, I, as we talked about in our last video cast podcast with you, Shane, this is a wide ranging cover up and it's involved the who's who of Australia's political elite. And Yaron Finkelstein, in my mind, is a key player in all of this. Well, Brittany Higgins mentioned his name in her evidence. Uh, he was apparently in contact with her sometime uh, after the alleged rape. So, he seems to be a key figure, and it would have been good if he had been called as a witness, but looks like we're not going to see that. So now one of the other issues there was that uh, Brittany Higgins uh, gave evidence that she was paid $2.3 million, and after tax and lawyers' fees, et cetera, she walked away with $1.9 million. Now her deed of release was actually uh, published later by the federal court, and it turns out she was paid $2,445,000, which is an extra one hundred. dollars 45000 above what she told the court. It's not a big issue, but uh, Bruce Lerman's barrister seemed to be implying it was a huge issue. But once the deed of release was uh, released, it was, the, the difference wasn't a key issue. But she did say in evidence that uh, they did admit liability. The government admitted liability in the settlement. Now, it turns out once you read the settlement, that's not true. There's uh, no admission of liability. And some of the trolls on social media made a big issue that, oh, she's lying again. But the fact that she was paid $2.3 million, is, or $2.4 million, is an admission of liability in itself. So to sit back and say she's lying is really a joke. And it was just a, obviously a misunderstanding uh, by her. 
I've personally been involved in a few employment disputes and, and the like, either as an advocate or myself being involved. And a payment such as this, especially from an institution like the Parliament House, the Department of Finance, paying such a large sum, if absolutely nothing happened, um, is ludicrous. Um, these institutions don't want to pay a cent to anyone who claims they've been victimized or abused or bullied or harassed. They actually have teams of lawyers to do everything in their power not to pay a cent. So the fact they paid Brittany Higgins to almost 2.5 million. And, and very early on, if you remember this, Shane, when she brought the claim against the Department of Finance and Parliament, they settled quite quickly, if you remember. It wasn't a long, long years drawn out thing. And so the fact they settled quickly and for, su for such a large amount is indicative of Brittany Higgins telling a story which contains large amounts of truth. Well, the thing is, if they had given her 50000 and said, oh, well, there's no admission of liability, you can sit back and say, well, they gave her 50000 to save on legal fees, so there's no admission yep. of liability. But when you're paying, two, like you say, almost $2.5 that's admission by itself, <laughs> even if they say in the contract there's no admission of liability. Now, the reason... People are saying, oh, they should, should be investigated why they paid her so much. The reason they had to pay her so much is because you, you had video evidence going missing. You had the uh, lounge being steam cleaned. You got senators lying and deceiving about the reality of the situation. If they had been called as witnesses at any uh, sort of trial, compensation trial, the government would have been in a lot of trouble. It would have been absolutely humiliating for the government. And uh, so really they sh had to pay as much as she really uh, wanted to some degree. And obviously, uh, I think uh, she's walked away with two and a half million. I just want to say this one point. People are saying she got paid way too much. And because other alleged victims don't get that much, and that's fair enough call. But what they're not factoring in, or the only thing what people don't factor in is she's got a lifetime of being attacked by News Corp. If you factor that in, she probably should have got five or ten million. <laughs> Because yeah. that's the reality of it. She's going to be attacked by News Corp for the next 5, 10, 15 years, probably forever, because that's the way they roll. They don't like her because she's a threat to their cash cow, the Liberal Party. So she didn't walk away with uh, more than she deserves anyhow, I don't think, because once she took a stand, she was always got, kind of going to come under fire by the News Corp propaganda machine. Now, the next one is a News Corp uh, in the ABC uh their dirty deal they're trying to keep secret. Now, they're two companies that often regularly go to court to challenge suppression orders. You know, you've got to have open justice, they tell the court. Well, in this situation, they sent a barrister into court, uh, Sibstein, his name is. I've come across him a couple of times. And he was there, defamation barrister, he was there arguing that News Corp and ABC, their dirty deals with Bruce Lerman should be remain secret. Um, and the old media didn't report on that at all. I couldn't find any reports on that, <laughs> but I was watching it live like the rest of the people watching it live. What was your take on that? That was, uh, what's that Akadaka song? Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. Um, ABC and News Corp, um, especially the ABC's um, capitulation to Lerman because they use taxpayers' money to pay off Lerman, and we know it's $145,000 to his uh, lawyers for their costs. Uh, hundred uh, was it hundred um, two hundred ninety five thousand from News Corp was it just was yeah, it yeah. I'm just under three hundred thousand from News Corp uh, Samantha Maiden and <laughs> the crusading gossip journalist <laughs> going into that um, it it just shows that and Bruce, we can't forget Bruce Lerman's Channel Seven one hundred twenty thousand dollar yearly rent payment as well he's running some kind of Ponzi scheme on <laughs> opening a case. <laughs> just to make some money, opening another case, then making a bit of money there, and then and then thinking that Channel 10 would eventually capitulate. So in his mind, um, I suspect Bruce has thought eventually Channel 10 would capitulate, but Channel 10 have done their job. They've read your articles. They've read my articles. They've done interesting research, which better than the AFP. <laughs> and so Bruce Lerman's right. got unstuck. They, they, Bruce Lerman has got unstuck in that he... He, he and his advisors were going by other previous defamation cases, but they didn't factor in the Ben Robert Smith case too much. That's what's kind of, they thought this was, 
there's been a view in the courts ever since the public interest uh, defense came in for defamation and there was a few vexatious defamation cases. You can see some of the justices in the legal system are getting enough of these rich people just throwing out these defamation cases when there's clear public interest. And I think Bruce Lerman thought he could run the Ponzi scheme here, that he'd, he'd scare off ABC, he'd scare off News Corp. Then Channel 10 would be like, oh, they've settled. We better eventually settle too and maybe not run this case as strong as we want to run. But we've seen all the witnesses. We've seen Brittany Higgins. We've seen Dr. Matt Collins QC running the case for Channel 10. Also, Sue Crisanthu for Lisa Wilkinson. And the ABC and News Corp have been embarrassed, especially the ABC here. Um, Justice Michael Lee said he wasn't going to suppress any of these details of the what what settlements they gave Bruce Lerman, these media companies, because he said that the ABCs will become public in a Senate's estimate hearing soon because it's owned by the Australian people and the Australian people will eventually know what the ABC paid. And thanks to that, News Corp was, he's like, I have to, I'm not going to let one go without the other. So both of you have to show your deeds. It's like a fresh air in terms of all this darkness for the last two years to have transparency coming to the fore and openness and yeah, as I wrote on Twitter when this was released late, uh, uh, was it midweek? It was late afternoon, midweek when the deeds were released on Wednesday or Thursday from memory. Um, I remember commenting, well, it sucks to be ABC and News Corp and Sam Maiden today because it's embarrassing because anyone watching the defamation case that's going on now is now scratching their heads wondering why they even settled with Bruce Lerman. Well, the thing is that... Uh... Even the other old media companies like Nine, uh, I think well, Channel 10 are involved in the case, but Nine and uh, who else is there? Well, they're basically all involved. <laughs> yeah. But you wouldn't expect Nine to report on it, how they tried to keep their dirty deal secret. Uh, but I think they were all embarrassed. They were embarrassed all the old media by trying it on. Uh, and as we know, Bruce Lemon got 295000 from News Corp. Uh, 130,000 they estimate from seven for the rent. Now, he actually got 150,000 from the ABC, but people are reporting it as 143 because 7,000 had to go to uh, Laura Tingle for her cost for discovery. She paid lawyers, apparently. But it should be calculated as 150 because that's a cost that Bruce Lerman ran up and he was going to have to pay that out of his own pocket. So just because seven grand went to her, not directly to him, that's paying off his yeah. liability. So he got 150000 I I wonder how they, some of these people calculate it because I've seen uh, others reporting it as 143000 yeah. as well. The one hundred and fifty, they took care of seven grand of his uh, liability that he, he was yeah. going to have to pay. Now, one of the big issues is Peter Dutton's former press secretary, Austin Winky, gave evidence, I think it was Tuesday, Um uh, had a memory like a sieve, couldn't remember anything. Someone should ask him what day it was. He probably would have failed that question. Now, he was there the night of the alleged rape at the pub uh, beforehand, where they were, at the pub and the nightclub. Um, had a memory like a sieve. But the fact that Peter Dutton's press secretary was there that night, um, he would have known in the days afterwards, without a doubt, what happened because... Uh, apparently he was fairly friendly with uh, Bruce Lerman. So he would have known days after, and Peter Dutton would have known too. So without a doubt, Peter Dutton's part of the cover-up. Ed, did you watch his uh, evidence? What did you think of him? He, was, he, he looked very nervous, and he looked like he wanted to get out there, out of the witness box as quickly as possible, which he did. Um, he, the one interesting thing, he did... Uh, he did um, say a couple interesting things where he confirmed that there was an open secret in Parliament that Lerman was the subject of media reports. Um, how can such a thing be an open secret if it hasn't been discussed already since 2019? Um, Austin Winky as Peter Dutton's uh, media advisor and Peter Dutton being the home affairs control freak he is, how is it possible that Peter Dutton had no idea about this until 2021 or whatever they claim that it is? Um, and so... It, just his mannerisms and his body language suggested that there, he doesn't want to be there because he doesn't want to get his boss in trouble, if you know, his former boss, Mr. Dutton, in trouble, who's now the leader of the Liberal Party. And we will discuss it maybe in a bit later in this um, discussion. Um, but 
there's you know there's possibilities that Peter Dudden was involved um, because we heard stuff about the CCTV footage as well in the court case uh, that may have uh, gone missing. And he met, he as a home affairs um, minister had um, authority over the AFP and also security service agencies. And so uh, I think Austin Winky's discomfort in the witness box was a example of the discomfort I suspect Peter Dudden is feeling behind the scenes. Well, I think in my mind, Peter Dutton ruled with an iron fist. And in my mind, he would have been the one coordinating the cover up along with uh, like yeah, Aaron right. Finkelstein in uh, uh, Scott Morrison's office, who was the Prime Minister at the time. And uh, I think Austin Winky obviously knows a lot more than he's saying. But that's life if, he, uh, if he's going to claim he's got a memory like a sieve, there's not much he can do. Now, there was one interesting moment before we move on from Mr. Winky, Shane. Um, there was one moment where the judge held him up, not a barrister, not signs of cross-examination, not his, you know, not Steve Wybrow, Mr. Wybrow, um, Bruce Lerman's lawyer. The judge, Justice Lee, held up Austin Winky towards the end of his short testimony and said, I want to I want to ask you a question. Did he ever give your credit card to Bruce Lerman on the night where he bought all those drinks and claimed he only spent $16? And Austin Winky straight away said, I did not give him my credit card. So the fact that judge is so interested about this credit card stuff is a big, big problem for Bruce Lerman. Because yeah, every that's, single that's... witness who was there on the night has kept saying he didn't use my card, only bought drinks with my card. I've got the bank records. You can see that for yourself. So there's this big question of this credit card mysterious credit card still, which the judge isn't going to let go of. I wonder if Bruce Lerman knows. I wonder if he knows he's lying. And, because he took those details to the police when he had the police interview. He said, look, I only spent X amount of dollars. So, you know, and maybe he that was part of his plan to show evidence he only spent $16, but without um, realising that they had the CCTV <laughs> where they could calculate he'd obviously spent a lot more. Now, you had three witnesses on the Tuesday. There was actually five, but three key ones who contradicted Bruce Lerman up front uh, contradict him about he claimed he didn't kiss Brittany Higgins. A witness said he did. Another witness said uh, that Bruce Lerman told her that he thought Brittany Higgins was good looking, which Bruce Lerman denies. And the other witness said uh, that Bruce Lerman told him that Bruce Lerman had invited invited Brittany Higgins to the pub on March 2nd. So this is a few weeks before the alleged rape, but I'm pretty sure uh, Bruce Lemon denies that too. Yes, yes. Uh, so you had three key witnesses contradicting key evidence, whether he kissed her, whether he found her attractive, whether he invited to the pub. So it wasn't a good day for Bruce Lerman because at the end of the hearing, they'll sit back and they'll summarise and they'll obviously go through all the witnesses who have contradicted Bruce Lerman. And when it's on key evidence, He's in a lot of trouble. Yeah, the three witnesses um, were very strong and credible. Um, Major Nikita Irvine, who was one of the witnesses who was there at the dock, um, Lauren Gain, um, who was there at the dock, and I think it was Nikki Harmer as well. And all three women also um, specifically said that they believe Brittany Higgins, what happened to her, and they've always believed it, and they, she told them many years ago. And for these credible people to tell these stories and to also give their eyewitness accounts of what they saw happening on the night. I remember one of the witnesses, it was Nikita Irvine, said as soon as she started working in Linda Reynolds' office, she had bad vibes off of Bruce and thought of him as creepy. She claimed that it was women's intuition. Um, and the fact we know what's happened to Bruce Lerman since uh, means it, it gives her strong credibility. <laughs> um, he's been charged with rape twice criminally. You know, he's got charges in Toowoomba there as well, currently in Queensland, your home state now. And so these three witnesses are going to be very difficult to overcome uh, Bruce Lerman's legal team because they're all Liberal Party associated. These aren't communist, um, radical journalists uh, like you and me. <laughs> These are all people heavily involved in the Liberal Party, and all of them, all of them have contradicted key parts of Bruce Lerman's evidence, but have also said they believe Brittany Higgins. They've said that on the stand. Um, well, one of them, uh, uh, the major, the Army major, I think she was actually Wednesday or Thursday. It was Jesse Watton, 
who's high up one of the deputy executives in the Liberal Party in WA. So when you're saying they're Liberal Party members, he's actually very high up in the Liberal Party yes. in WA, an ally of some degree to uh, Senator Linda Reynolds. Yes. So he's contradicted uh, Bruce Lemon's evidence in relation to inviting Brittany Higgins to the pub on March the 2nd. Now, it was interesting, you talk about Major, Major Nikita, what's her name? Irvine. Uh, Irvine. Irvine. Nikita Irvine, yes. Uh, I found it fairly amusing when uh, Bruce Lemon's barrister, Steve Wybrow, was insinuating she was lying and she ripped back, are you yes. accusing me of uh, committing lying perjury under, under oath? Yeah. yeah. Um, and he backed right off. So she was pretty hard with <laughs> And she had some personal things to say about Bruce too, I think. She didn't like his vibe or whatever, didn't want to have anything to do with him. Uh, I don't know if that sort of thing helps in any degree, but uh, that was interesting. I'll let you talk about this because it's something I never really followed as probably as much as you, ASIS. That was raised. Yes. You want to talk about that? Yeah. So for a long time, I've been suggesting this cover-up it involves the highest of the politicians, as we mentioned, Peter Dudd and Scott Morrison here on Finkelstein. But to actually do the techniques of the cover-up, um, it's highly likely that a security services agency was involved, that agency most likely being ASIS. Um, we heard this week during the defamation trial, Lauren Gain, one of the witnesses, said that uh, Bruce Lerman told her, at, um, I think it was at the event before the later incident, it was a, that March 2 date or something, where Lauren Gain said that Bruce Lerman's Told her that he was he got a job at ASIS and was in, and was just waiting for his final clearance. Um, Steve Wybrow, the barrister, then said, "Oh, Bruce Lerman already had the top level security clearance in Australia anyway. Did you know that?" So it's brought into play here um, the security services because someone we've we we heard from the AFP officers too. They've never had this much difficulty accessing things from Parliament House, including CCTV footage from day dot. And the AFP officer was very forceful when discussing this on the stand on Friday. And the, so there's suggestions here that secret services have been involved, probably under Peter Dutton's say-so. Um, we know from the Walter Sofranoff, the much maligned Walter Sofranoff inquiry, there was already comments there that CCT couldn't be accessed by the AFP and they couldn't gain it. And they, they were a bit, it was a bit strange for them. More evidence has come out at the defamation trial that something nefarious has gone on here. And the only people who can delete or alter or misuse CCTV footage from Parliament House are Australia's security services. They're the only, you and I, Shane, can't go to Parliament House and delete footage. We can't alter footage. Um, it can only be done under very, very high level of the government say so. And so this is why the cover-up has gone on for so long, because it's not just about Bruce Lerman. We've got security services that got involved for whatever reason. Was it a politician telling it to get involved? Was it because Bruce Lerman, as Bruce Lerman has told the AFP and Lauren Gain, he's, he himself is an ACES agent. Were the security services getting involved to protect one of their own? And so no. these questions are going to be asked more and more as well. Oh, I don't think there's enough evidence to say they were involved, but there's enough evidence to say there's a strong suspicion they were involved. Oh. There's a link. There's uh, definitely a link. Now, but what did Bruce Lemon actually tell Lawrence Gain? He was he he he, he was employed by ACES, but he was waiting for he had gotten a job with ACES. He was waiting for his clearance to come through. Final clearance, and she said, "You're an idiot." Her words were, "You're." I called him an idiot for saying that publicly because no one should be talking about either applying or getting a job at a security agency like ACES. Uh, Justice Lee then held her up a minute or two later saying, I want I want to take you back to what you said. Was Bruce Lerman being serious when he said he got this security job? And Miss Gaines said, yes, he was very serious when he said it to me, but I thought he was lying because I know for a fact, legally, you're not allowed to talk about this stuff. But we all know Bruce Lerman's a fully-fledged narcissist. Narcissists like to boast. So we don't know, was he lying to the police, because he, he told the AFP about his security services job as well. In that interview with the AFP, it's in the transcript, mentions it three times. Is he lying to the okay. AFP about this? Yes. It's, is he lying to the AFP about the security services job? Is he lying to Lauren Gain about the security services job? And if he's oh, lying okay. about it, why did he lie? And so uh, there's these questions that will come up. 
he, yeah, he, he could be a fantasist, right. but if he's a fantasist, that adds to Brittany Higgins' claims of truth. And if he's a secu- if he actually is a security services agent, that also adds to the fact that the cover up, why this cover up is so weird and strange. And so he's put himself in a position here where he can't win. Because now I, I, I myself will be calling up ASUS this week, asking them, yes. asking them, saying, do you want to be associated with Bruce Lerman in any way? Did, is he lying about this job? Can you just say he lied? Can you say that? And we'll see what put they Put in an email to him and, and they'll yeah. probably say, oh, we don't respond. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, but, but they might do. They might respond and might respond and say, no, Bruce yeah. Lerman's lying. We, we've never exactly. had anything to do with him. Um, but last thing, we'll finish off with Justice Lee. You spoke about his transparency. Um, he has been very good. Uh, he's made sure everything's been released, pretty well all the documents. There is a few things that haven't been released. I noticed a picture of the alcohol, the whiskey, at the previous office has not been put up there. I think it was uh, Exhibit 29. Exhibit 30 was put up where you can see just the okay. edge of a bottle of wine, but Zip 29 wasn't put up. And uh, I'm just going to click that. We got uh, nine minutes ago. And so I wonder why they didn't put that up. That's another thing we should talk about. The federal government intervened. They wanted to intervene at the beginning of the trial, and they wanted the full court books. They wanted to see all the evidence before it was uh, published online for the public. So they wanted to uh, filter it all. Now, which is a scandal. Uh, they shouldn't have been anywhere near it. I think they said for security reasons. Mm-hmm. Now, I thought about that. That might be one of the reasons the whiskey bottles <laughs> photo hasn't been published, Exhibit 29. Uh, that's all I can think. Or well, maybe they did that uh, because they know it's embarrassing for uh, the government. I think that's probably more likely why that hasn't yeah. gone up. But by and large, uh, Justice Lee has been very good. He didn't make that threat earlier on about closing off the uh, live stream, but all it was a threat was over and over an extension by him, as we discussed last time in the last video. But he has been very good, very transparent. And I, my viewpoint is that he he's watched all everything else that has, has happened in this matter, and everyone else's reputation has been trashed. Uh, senators, politicians, pretty well everyone, including former Judge Walter Sofranoff, He's currently yes. in hiding on the run himself. Um, I'm not the only person on the run in Queensland. Walter Sofranoff is too. <laughs> and Where in the world are you, Walter? <laughs> so I think he's had a look at that, Justice Lee, and said, well, yeah. Walter Sofranoff's reputation has been trashed for the rest of his life. There is no comeback for Walter Sofranoff to justify what he's done. And I think there's probably a motivator for Justice Lee to make sure everything's transparent and so the public can't criticise him or attack him in any way. How, how do you perceive that? Uh, my admiration for Justice Lee only grows and grows each day. I think he's really put himself in a position past himself and his own p- privilege, and he's realised how important this case is for a, the Australian public in terms of legal, media, political history, and a step forward for all victims of uh, sexual assault. I I think he's really showing how the system has worked in the past. And he's really, I think Justice Lee's um, control of the courtroom and the way he's allowing evidence and what kind of evidence and the documents being published, it's going to be a circuit breaker for how these cases are maybe tried in the future. Um, And on Friday, even on Friday, just before the session closed for the week, Justice Lee made some wonderful announcements for open justice and transparency he allowed the expert lip reader from the uk to be um, allowed to be heard and have his evidence heard um he he warned fiona brown linda reynolds chief of staff that she, she most likely has to come and give evidence in person unless she's you know she's on literally on the brink of death which he has said the medical um uh, notes from her psychiatrist don't indicate that and so we're going to see fiona brown maybe the live stream may be delayed when fiona brown gives evidence but it, she's likely kind of have to give evidence in the courtroom next week he also um just before the uh, session ended this week he also made sure that a politician a queensland politician who's going to appear as a witness um both uh, steve wybrow and the channel 10 lawyers were happy for him to appear by video link but uh, justice lee said 
that's not on here in this courtroom. Every witness needs to be treated the same. And I want to watch every witness under the gaze and pressure of being in a courtroom and in strange surroundings. Just because he's a politician, I'm not going to give him special dispensation. A lot of judges would, especially when both barristers for both sides were saying we're okay with it. Um, but for Justice Lee to do that, I think he knows there's he senses this is much more bigger than Bruce Lerman just by the questions he's been asking. And he really wants to put a full stop on this whole case as it's been going on for four years now, two years since Brittany went public, uh, being covered up for four years. And so, Justice Lee, you can see the comments as well on my Twitter. I've, met, I've given a few, three huge cheers for Justice Lee. Thousands of people agreeing with me, long comments about the first time that they can see the justice system actually at a high level, someone's actually doing it for the public, not for their own boys club. You've had a lot of run-ins with judges, Shane, uh, that boys club mentality. Um, so it's a breath of fresh air and it's really good for the public to, like the robo debt commissioner, Catherine Holmes, um, it's really given people a bit of hope that Australia can change and not just be this cloistered boys club. And so we have to thank um, the good judge and we can only hope um, that clear-minded critical thinking continues on for the next week or two while this case draws to a conclusion. And I'm eagerly awaiting his um, conclusions and summations in written form because he's quite a witty man, Shane. He's quite funny. The one of his comments was before the end of the day, all right, we'll be back here tomorrow, same time, same back case, same back time, like he's Batman. <laughs> and so he's, he's, he's giving this case that everything, I think he's putting everything into everything he's learned over 40, 50 years as a lawyer, then as a judge, he's putting his all his intelligence and his perspective into this. And it's it's we have to be thankful. We we really do. I don't know if we have to be thankful that he's doing his job and he's probably well, got so many more. others before well, Walter Sofranoff didn't do his job at a basic level, Shane. So we've got to I know, but we, we we shouldn't be thankful. <laughs> what we should do is appreciate the fact that he's uh, yeah. doing a good job. Yeah. Not so much yeah. being thankful because he's on probably three, four hundred grand a year. <laughs> paid pretty good dollars. It, it's it's not so much we should be thankful of him. It's more that we should be bitterly disappointed in the people like Walter Sofranov. That's right. That's probably uh, uh, because we're so used to well, not well in this matter, at least being disappointed with the public servants involved, whether it be judges, former judges, police, or whatever. <laughs> We come across one person who's actually doing his job and uh, we're all sort of grateful to some degree. Before we go off, uh, I have to make one final comment. The pressure is finally yeah. uh, related to all this because the pressure keeps growing and growing. More information keeps coming about, about the cover-up. Linda Reynolds is feeling the pressure even more, suing Shane Drungold for defamation now, the former ACT prosecutor. So the this ACT isn't going to end well. Yeah, this isn't going to end well for any of these. I call them clowns now, Shane. They're clowns. What has Linda Reynolds done for the Australian public apart from sue people for defamation? Um, Nothing. And so this is not going to end well for any of these characters. And the sooner we can close this chapter on this sordid part of Australian history, it will be better for everyone. Yep, she's suing the ACT government as well, as well as Shane Drumgold. And as I said in a tweet, uh, she sent me a legal threat back in August. And I publish an article about it. So if people want to see that, they can go to my website and they can see the legal threat from a lawyer in WA. But I stood my ground. I haven't heard anything from them since. <laughs> so we'll see what happens there. But we'll probably catch up next week. Uh, we'll see what happens during the week, see if there's any excitement within the court case again or whether it becomes fairly mundane and boring. We don't know. And we might catch up again next week. So thank you for your time, Turkin. I think the highlight will be next week, the lip reader. Everyone should be yeah. tuned in when the lip reader is giving his analysis because this is almost like mini series stuff here now. This is like, uh, this is great entertainment, but also very clever, very clever work by the Channel, Channel 10 legal team. And like you said, it's going to end up being a mini series or uh, full length movie. Who will movie. play us, Shane? Who will play us? We're minor characters in this. Who's going to play us? Clowns, I think. Couple someone clowns suggested Bra someone, someone suggested George Clooney and Brad Pitt. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Any yeah, till next week. Until next. Keep up the great work, Shane. We'll be watching this case avidly. I may even go in person to the federal court this week when if I have time. So we'll see if I can do that. We'll keep an eye out for you in the background of the live stream. Yeah, yeah I'll All wait right, for then. everyone. Talk to, you. Talk to you later. Thank you. Have a good one, Shane. Bye. And thank you for watching the second podcast with Sirkin. If you'd like to watch the first podcast, just go to my 
YouTube channel, the Kangaroo Court of Australia YouTube channel. And the first podcast is also on the Bruce Lerman trial. The second podcast has been a follow-up to that. And I'll finish off like I finish off all my videos. Kangaroo Court of Australia is independent media. I publish a website and a YouTube channel. And I'm 100% crowdfunded from viewers like yourself. So please support my Patreon account. I currently have 347 patrons uh, donating $2,425 a month. And I need to almost double it to become financially viable. So if you could support that, that'd be great. And you can donate any amount, $3, 5 10 15 20 30 40 $50 a month, whatever suits your budget. And the link for the Patreon account will be below this video on YouTube and also on my website. And please share this video on social media. Other than that, thank you for your time and have a good day.